no good for, uh, for the United States. I mean, we're too interconnected in too many ways for us to have a containment policy, a military containment strategy. From military tension, American companies, academia, and local organizations stand ready to cooperate with Chinese partners in the best interests of both of our countries. To economic cooperation and beyond. China and the United States share many challenges. News being made as the United States and China meet behind closed doors in Washington. What's been discussed? What's been decided? And where do the two nations still face differences? A special edition of Biz Asia America right now on CCTV News. Thanks so much for staying with Biz Asia America. I'm Mike Walter. And I'm Philip Yen. Michelle McCorry is standing by to join us from New York City on what has been another historic day. That's absolutely right. This day marked the conclusion of the fifth annual Strategic and Economic Dialogue. In short, some of the most important talks between the United States and China of the year. And we've heard just about everything discussed from Edward Snowden to cybersecurity to trade to military moves and including climate change. And you know, it takes months to put something like this together. I mean, they started working on this about five months ago, just trading conversations just to get all of these people in the same room to carry on these conversations this week. You think there's a lot of thank you notes they're going to get ready to write up <laughs> yeah. that to send each other when they both get back to their respective desks? I suspect they're probably already working on those as well. You know who will know is Nathan and Jessica. They've been watching this and they're at the hotel where the dinner is going on tonight, that uh, final evening wow. together. That's right. In fact, uh, this is the dinner in honor of the U.S. Strategic and Economic Dialogue. We're kicking our voices now because Yang Jiechi is actually speaking, and we want to give him some respect as he goes through his remarks. But what he said earlier, uh, wrapping up uh, this two days, uh, was that basically the U.S. and China have to get out of the zero-sum game. Uh, where if one wins, the other one loses. It's got to turn to a sort of win-win situation. And Jessica, that applies not just to the strategic sphere, but the economic one as well. Absolutely, and we have some fairly big progress to report on the economic track today. Of course, we heard earlier from uh, Vice Premier Wang Yang making a number of humorous remarks to the audience here this evening, but throughout the day, he has really carried and co-chaired the economic talks out of which came some big prog progress on a bilateral investment treaty. Uh, they, both sides agreed on Thursday, the final day of the talk, that China would include all areas of investment, all areas of its economic market in that deal. We don't know when those negotiations will begin, but it's important that it will begin under these circumstances. Have a look at it. China announced its intention to negotiate a high-standard bilateral investment treaty with us that will include all stages of investment, and all sectors, a significant breakthrough and the first time China has agreed to do so with another country. The U.S. pledges to welcome investment from China, including investment of SOEs and sovereign wealth funds. The U.S. also pledges that security review will only be based on national security. And so there you hear uh, the Chinese uh, counterpart to uh, Secretary Lu really talking about the fact that Chinese companies have had a hard time investing in the United States. We've had a lot of problems. Uh, China, uh, China's Huawei, ZTE, uh, Smithfield Foods most recently, all of, uh, of, of companies that have tried to merge with U.S. companies and have had some problems, of course. That goes in the reverse as well. That was a topic of conversation. But let's get to your news on the security track. Yeah, you know, we've been waiting all week for the military to military uh, uh, aspect of these talks. They were held behind closed doors. But what we can say is that both countries have announced that they're going to set up a mechanism to warn each other when they're having major military activities. Now, why is this? Well, remember back in April 2001 with the Hainan Island incident and the American pilots, they want to avoid that as, as China grows and the U.S. rebalances, uh, of course, uh, to the Pacific. But, of course, there's still some mistrust. Let's take a look. As military discussions between China and the United States continue in Washington, the Chinese Navy and its Russian counterparts hold the largest joint exercise China has ever staged with a foreign country, an example of China's growing might. Here in Washington, that growth is part of the military-to-military -military dialogue. 
at the centre of this week's annual strategic dialogue meeting that covers security as well as economic issues. America's commander in the Pacific says the U.S. accepts and welcomes China's naval expansion and calls it inevitable. He acknowledged that the two countries interpret maritime law differently, but is optimistic the two sides can avoid tensions on the high seas. We are having an ongoing dialogue with the Chinese military about, you know, what are the kind of the rules of the road of how we manage our relationship as the Chinese Navy inevitably gets larger and inevitably will come out further from their territorial seas. The U.S. presence in the Asia Pacific is not going anywhere, so we have to manage our ability to operate around each other, and I think that's it's a, it's, it's a doable thing. U.S. commanders stress they see China's military growth as an opportunity for Beijing to take on a bigger role in the world stage, as China has done with anti-piracy efforts off the coast of Somalia and a joint humanitarian exercise recently in Brunei alongside U.S. warships. The U.S., however, is also trying to convince China that the Pentagon's strategic rebalancing in the Pacific isn't a military strategy to contain China's rise. This week, U.S. officials tried to reassure Beijing that placing missile defenses in Alaska was aimed at protecting the U.S. from the DPRK. The U.S. has deployed the same missiles on the Pacific island of Guam, a U.S. territory. There's a perception that, that all these things we're doing is an attempt to contain China. <clears throat> and the reality, and, and we tell them this as well, I have, is that we have no, there's no need or intention there's no good for, uh, for the United States. I mean, we're too interconnected in too many ways for us to have a containment policy, a military containment strategy. And while China and Russia hold joint exercises, the U.S. is looking forward to having China participate in the rim of the Pacific Naval Exercises in 2014 for the first time. 22 countries joined the last U.S.-led drills. It's hoped that closer ties between the two militaries and others in the region and beyond will result from China's participation. And Yan Jiechi, who is speaking behind me, the state councillor, also promised that the US and China will communicate more deeply over what divides them, including Syria and Iran. And just want to bring you in here because there were some sort of reassuring words also on the economic front about China's economic slowdown, right? Absolutely. We haven't heard from uh, the folks at the PBOC today, as well as the finance minister and the Ministry of Commerce, uh, who briefed us separately, is that China is looking uh, to reassure people that the slowdown is just part of the economic reforms that they're implementing. That's what it's really about. And in addition, they get, did get a word in uh, with the Federal Reserve because we know that Chairman Bernanke was at the table with the U.S. Central Bank, and they were able to express to the Americans that they would like to see an, a sooner exit rather than a uh, longer-term exit from the quantitative easing program, which, of course, is the stimulus that the United States has been doing to promote its own growth. Back to you, Mike. All right, Jessica Stone and Nathan King, live for us in Washington, D.C. Thanks so much. Well, as Phil mentioned earlier in the broadcast, one of the points of contention between the United States and China is cybersecurity. The Obama administration claims China steals intellectual property, trade secrets, and other proprietary information. And in response, China claims the U.S. is making a false distinction between economic theft and other forms of espionage. So what happened behind closed doors? Well, here's what a senior U.S. administration official said this week. What we are concerned about is cyber-enabled, government-sponsored theft of intellectual property. And the Chinese do understand what we're talking about, and it's not the same as what they're talking about. Joining us to talk more about this is Brandon Andrews, a legislative specialist at Inside America. We've seen a lot of uh, smiles and glad-handing. Sure. Everyone seems to be getting along well. But this seems to be one bone of contention between these two countries. Wouldn't you agree? Sure, I do. And, you know, they took a step forward by having the first cybersecurity working group uh, within the, the entire summit earlier this week. Now, as you said, there's a lot of smiles, a lot of glad handing, but one positive thing that may come out of that cybersecurity working group is a responsibility factor. So China taking responsibility for hackers that hack into U.S. systems and the U.S. taking full responsibility for U.S. hackers or folks based in the U.S. who may hack into Chinese systems. That's a first step. Um, there's certainly a long way to go, but something positive that's come out of this. I had talked to a, a former Assistant Secretary of State, Kurt Campbell, earlier this week, and he said that this is really an area where both countries can benefit. If they, if they could just come up with guidelines, because this is a problem everywhere. Sure. 
It really is. And, you know, it, it's a problem in the security space. So when you think about the Department of Defense, the NSA, the CIA, et cetera, but it's also a really big problem uh, in the economic space. So you talk about supply chain. You talk about the manufacturer and sale of counterfeit parts, parts that may have some back door that links back to China or somewhere else that have been sold to the U.S. And so the economic effect of not having clear guidelines in the cyberspace uh, is really the, the, the biggest thing. You know, uh, there were a lot of uh, officials in the United States who were beating up on China, saying, you know, they, they can't just say sure. everybody does this. And then all of a sudden, Edward Snowden shows up, sure. and then the president of the United States himself, when he's confronted with the Der Spiegel article where European allies are upset that perhaps the United States is spying on their own friends, sure. he says, well, everybody does this. So <laughs> it, it does seem as though everybody does it. I guess it's the distinction is what exactly is okay and what's not okay. Yeah, and, and then again, when you don't have clear guidelines, you don't have a clear standard or clear rules out there, it's hard to hold anyone accountable. But I, I think the distinction, and you mentioned this earlier, that uh, folks from the U.S. will say is that what Chinese corporations do perhaps goes beyond just corporate espionage or what, what, would, what we would see normally uh, in between two competing companies. Uh, and I think the fact that uh, the Chinese government um, is giving big dividends or, or giving big support to a lot of these companies. Um, there's, there's a gray area as far as being able to track where the funding comes from. And I think that gray area makes some of these, some of this corporate espionage seem like it may be state-sponsored corporate espionage. You know, I talked to a former official uh, in a previous administration who said to me that, uh, you know, it, businesses try and steal secrets from one another sure. all the time. It mm -hmm. happens here in the United States. It happens all over the place. And he said uh, that, you know, if the United States was better at its game, that, that <laughs> this is really what this is all about. The yeah. United States is not up to the challenge, and that's why they're so upset about this. Is that a fair assessment? Well, you have seen in the past few years uh, with the establishment of U.S. Cyber Command, and then there's similar entities within a lot of U.S. government agencies and working groups, et cetera, that have been established. You've seen a real push in the United States to be able to get uh, further on uh, as far as cyber capability is concerned. And so, what, but one of the issues is that if a U.S. company suffers a cyber attack, um, sometimes they don't report it because of the effect on the bottom line. They don't want investors to not be, you know, as uh, supportive or, or, to, or to be wavering because of this attack. And the U.S. government needs that information from the companies to be able to continue to build the wall necessary. So it's kind of a catch-22. I've got one final question for you. Um, if the Snowden case hadn't happened, obviously the United States probably would have gone in a little bit more like this. Uh, sure. Did that hurt uh, their stance going into these talks? I think, I think it, it definitely, as you said, hurt the argument that China is doing something that no one else is doing. And if you talk about the economic piece, there's a distinction to be made there. But in terms of the state-sponsored espionage, the state-sponsored uh, cyber attacks, if you will, um, it, it definitely puts a dent in that argument. Brandon Andrews, thank you for coming in and talking sure. to us, offering Thanks. your analysis. Certainly appreciate it. Time now to head to New York. We'll check in with Michelle McCory. Thank you so much, Mike. And here in New York, investors are keeping a close eye on not just what comes out of these talks, but on how any deals or agreements are actually enacted. Agreements on trade, tariffs, and other economic matters all have a direct impact on the markets. And of course, the health of the Chinese economy as a whole plays a major role, as we've seen in the past few weeks, as worries over a Chinese credit crunch have sent shockwaves through the markets. Let's now turn to Beijing for more on how the talks are being viewed there. And for that, we go to CCTV's Ai Yang. Ai. Hi, Michelle. Well, first of all, uh, Beijing this time has generally covered the uh, strategic and economic dialogue in a very positive light. And uh, although it's still early morning in Beijing right now, the domestic media have already picked up some of the highlights from the, re from the results. And one of them is the bilateral investment treaty. Of course, the talk starts more than five years ago, but uh, this time uh, the negotiation is thought to have uh, seen some breakthroughs and this of course will be uh, good news for both China and the United States because it means in the future both markets may be uh, further opened up for each other. For example, right now we know that U.S. investors face 
uh, a number of barriers, including some uh, uh, ownership limits in up to 90 domestic sectors here in China. But the bilateral investment treaty may mean that in the future, China is willing to loosen some of the restrictions and even welcome foreign funds into some of these state-owned enterprises. And also, similarly for China, we know that in the past, a number of Chinese companies, including but uh, not limited to, uh, such as phone makers Huawei and ZTE, pork producer Shanghui as well as uh, the uh, heavy machinery Sanyi Corporation, have all experienced frustrations doing businesses in the United States. But the uh, debilitated investment treaty may mean that the U.S. is willing to open up its market further for Chinese investors as well. But of course, the, uh, the treaty is still under negotiation right now, so we have to wait and see how uh, the two markets are willing to further open up to each other. OK, thank you so much, Ayang, live for us in Beijing. So will we really see the dawn of a new chapter in U.S.-China relations? Joining us for more on this is uh, Ann Lee, author of What the U.S. Can Learn from China and adjunct professor of economics and finance at New York University. And thanks so much for joining us. We've seen some thorny issues come up from cybersecurity to trade. What have been the most contentious points both for the U.S. and for China? From an economic standpoint, we are quite familiar with the issues of currency uh, because the U.S. have often accused China of keeping the currency too low. And then obviously trade and investment are also thorny issues. Uh, in the past, China has been the recipient of a lot of foreign direct investment, but lately the, rever the trend is reversing. So China is now investing in a lot of other countries, as we've seen in Africa and Latin America. And China has been trying to invest in the U.S., but there have been a number of high-profile cases where their investments have been blocked. And the most recent one is the Smithfield uh, pork acquisition, where uh, Still even under review. Under review, but clearly there's political pressure from opinion polls basically saying that, you know, a lot of Americans oppose the acquisition uh, on security issues, which for a lot of folks who understand what's really going on, find it truly ludicrous because they find that there is no security issue here, but it's more political. Um, and so I think this is an area where the Chinese really want to address with the United States because if you don't have open investments where both sides are trying to play by the rules and there are no security issues involved and yet they are still being blocked, then that becomes a real barrier to good relations. Uh, and economic relations has been underpinning the, the real relationship between U.S. and China. Right, so both sides came into this with a couple of contentious points on their own. As the dialogue wraps up, where do you think we're likely to see the most breakthrough? Which areas can we foresee being resolved in the not too distant future? I would suspect that it's probably an area of clean technology because Obama has made a lot of public comments that this is an area he cares about, that we have to be responsible about climate change and um, carbon reductions. The Chinese have also said the same thing, and in fact, China has made a lot of investments into alternative energy. They're uh, the leader in wind technology investments as well as in solar, as many people know. And I feel that this could be a low-hanging fruit where research and joint development and joint ventures can happen uh, without too much establishment interest trying to block things. Both of the countries have said that they have an intention for a bilateral investment agreement. That's a pretty big coup, isn't it? It would be if it happens. Uh, unfortunately, I think there's so much political constipation in Washington that I don't see that happening anytime soon. Uh, anytime someone mentions the word China, it evokes emotional responses from people that... Even when it comes to bilateral investments? Absolutely. It's, uh, it, it, it's been associated with things as far as human rights and other areas that have nothing to do with investments. So this uh, gets muddied and, and it makes it difficult to have real logical uh, negotiations around these things. But uh, 
I suspect that because the United States needs to create a lot of new jobs, China also needs that uh, imperative as well, that hopefully they can find areas where they can okay. do that. Okay, so still a long way to go in terms of some concrete progress. That's uh, Anne Lee, author of What the U.S. Can Learn from China. For more on the strategic economic dialogue, it's back to Phil in D.C. Phil. All right, Michelle, thank you very much. We're going to come back to you in just a short bit. You've got other big news as well. Now, as the U.S. and China move to boost cooperation on many economic issues in their talks, there is no such spirit of friendship as a court here in Washington. The case between a Chinese company and the president of the United States shows just how far the two countries have to go. CCTV reports. Rawls, owned by Chinese industrial giant Sanyi Group, has held its second hearing against President Obama after his executive order barred Rawls' wind farm project near a U.S. naval facility in Oregon. The focus of this 90-minute hearing is over the issues of whether Rawls owns the property interest of the project and whether it had a meaningful opportunity to be notified about the order before it was issued. In recent years, Chinese investment in the U.S. has been climbing. By the end of 2012, the non-finance direct investment reached 90 billion U.S. dollars. An important portion of that investment is attributed to Chinese companies merging with and acquiring American ones. China has had success in buying some U.S. companies, but there have been cases where deals collapsed, due in large part by resistance from American government and lawmakers. Most Chinese companies are keeping silent when suffering setbacks, but Rawls is fighting back. Chinese companies usually talk very little and keep a low profile in the effort to calm things down when there's a conflict. They even make a lot of compromise when they're involved in trade disputes. But I don't think that's the American way. We must try to make our voice heard by the U.S. government like the Americans do. We should try to resolve problems in the U.S. in the American way. Rose bought this wind farm from a Greek company. But as soon as this Chinese company took the project, the smooth operation ran into trouble. I think it's unfair to us because before we purchased the wind farm, the Greek company had completed all the procedures for approval, including that from the military authorities. But as soon as we took over the project, it became an issue affecting national security. Of course China is not treated the same way as Britain or Greece. We have defense treaties with those countries. The U.S. and China are much more likely to go into a conflict than the U.S. and Greece. So the national security risk from a Chinese company or a Russian company or an Iranian company is very different than the national security risk from a Greek company. The judge did not announce the rulings today, and it may take about one or two months for the result. Raw said it's very confident about winning the case and will fight until there is no place to sue. Wang Hui, CCTV. Sony is not the only Chinese company running into problems in the U.S. market. Just yesterday, we talked about the Chinese conglomerate Shuanghui's planned $7.1 billion takeover of pork giant Smithfield Foods. Smithfield CEO was on Capitol Hill here in Washington trying to dispel concerns over national security concerns. The deal is awaiting an interagency committee's approval to proceed. Chinese telecom equipment makers Huawei and ZTE also have had trouble getting into the U.S. market over concerns about spying. In October, a U.S. congressional committee recommended Huawei be barred from acquiring U.S. assets and from supplying any equipment to telecom projects because of worries over cyber sabotage and spying. Now, Huawei said the company has all but given up selling its equipment in the U.S. for now. The company plans to focus on other markets, such as Europe. Now, politics and business not agreeing is not new. In 2005, Chinese oil giant Sinook proposed to buy Unocal for $18.5 billion. It started a massive debate here in Washington, D.C., over whether to block the deal for security reasons. And remember, that was a time when concerns over oil, especially from the Middle East and the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, were key issues. Sinook ultimately withdrew its bid and has become a poster child for what happens when the U.S.-China trade relations go sour. Now, despite the setbacks, there have been efforts in the U.S. to put on a friendly face on the face of business investment. The Sunshine State of Florida is attracting Chinese businesses. Nitsa Soldad Perez went to an event that brings Miami, Latin America, and China all together. 
More than 5,000 visitors attended this year's China Sourcing Fair in Miami, showcasing Chinese manufactured products for resellers in Latin America. This is our third year in Miami. We're, uh, we're very pleased with the turnout this year. We had a, a lot more buyers coming from uh, Latin America. That was, that's our target for the show. We're looking for importers, distributors, traders coming from the Latin American markets. Consumer electronics were big items here, as were toys. But the array of products at the Miami Beach Convention Center couldn't have been more diverse, ranging from housewares, sporting goods, and things for the garden. According to the Florida Chamber of Commerce, Greater China is now Florida's largest foreign trading partner outside of Latin America. But business wasn't the only thing that attracted Chinese exhibitors to this fair. I really love the Miami, this city, and it gave me the very you know, good experience. I like the people there, I like the weather there, everything is so perfect. And this show for us is our first time, and we feel it's not bad. And the customer here, we think the quality well. Good. It's so much that uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm amazed. You know, I couldn't tell you exactly what because I, I have uh, like do dollar stores, uh -huh. and I come here looking for stuff for dollar store, but there's so much of it, you really can't say I want this or that. It's I'm on one. On this third edition of the China Sourcing Fair, electronics and clothing have been dethroned. The most popular items this year are the home products. If there was one criticism buyers had. It was a number of products exhibited. They were hoping to see even more products from China. We had been to the fair in China, uh -huh. and we were expecting something in that line, you know, the variety, the price line, and the, but it was, um, it was good, but not as expected. The fairs have expanded to around the globe, to South Africa, India, Dubai in the Middle East, and now Miami, a gateway to Latin America for Chinese suppliers. Nitsa Soledad Perez, CCTV, Miami. And you know, Mike's back here and, and we're, we're talking about the events and one thing that really struck out at me in these meetings is what they haven't talked about, which is the Chinese Yuan really hasn't been an issue this time around, unlike other years. Right, and of course during the political season, it was, uh, you know, the RMB was constantly talked about, uh, Mitt Romney, the challenger, constantly talking about uh, the currency. What I thought was interesting as you marched through these businesses, I talked to somebody on Wall, at Wall Street uh, a few months back who actually tries to shepherd some of these Chinese companies as they come over to the United States, and he said the number one obstacle is they'll go through all of these steps and then the government at some point shuts the door. And I think what's got to be difficult for the, the people from the Chinese delegation is trying to understand how the mechanisms of Washington work. Because the Obama well, we administration... we don't even understand well, how no, Washington don't. works. <laughs> you know, you're right. Obama administration may be like this, but you still have Congress to deal with and you have a lot of lawmakers with a lot of different points of view. So People forget that cities across this country, including states, they all want investment, whether it's from China, Japan, Europe, it doesn't matter where it's from, they welcome that investment. It's the federal government that ultimately says yes or no to any big, big deals that make headlines. But we forget there are lots of hundreds Absolutely. of thousands of small deals that get done every single day. We and, just don't talk about it. And them. you know what? These state governors know that. I mean, you see governors from all these states lining up trying to elicit more Chinese business. They know it's key to their, to their state's survival in many respects. Yeah.